Hey everyone, Sean and Dave here from Saturday Morning Cartoons. We need to thank the following amazing people for going to our Patreon account and supporting this show. So a huge thank you to... Jonathan Renteria Elie. John Helter. Jack Connolly. Derek Haynes. Alex Kazanis. Jarmaine Myrick. Tyrese Walton. Allison Keane. Dr. Jason Woods. The wonderful Melanie Harker. The incomparable Sean Paul Ellis. Oh, and the phenomenal David Trumbor. Uh, thank you so much. Now, you guys might wonder why we are thanking ourselves and some familiar names of the podcast. It's because we want you to know that we not only appreciate your uh, donations to the podcast here, but we are actually putting in our hard-earned dollars as well. So to give you guys an idea of what you can actually get for some of these monthly contributions through Patreon, if you can't contribute any money whatsoever, we would love it if you guys would just visit patreon.com slash Saturday Morning Cartoons, remember that's morning with a U, and just share that link out among your social media uh, pages. That would help us out a lot and just get the word out there. If you do want to kick in a couple of bucks, you get some cool stuff back in return. So you may not know that we send out a monthly newsletter that not only tells people about upcoming news that we have going on, and we've definitely got some cool stuff coming in the next couple of months here for you. But we'll also announce the upcoming list of shows that we're going to be covering. So if there's a cartoon out there that you actually like, you're going to get to hear about it in the monthly newsletter. Other than that, you also get special uh, thank yous in the newsletter. You get a special shout out like this one right here in each and every episode. You can get early access to weekly episodes. And you can also get access to our special behind the scenes rambling between Sean and myself. Oh boy. Yeah, there's some gems in there. So you're going to want to check that out. Again, head on over to patreon.com slash Saturday Morning Cartoons to do so. And thank you so much to everyone who is a current patron. Thank you to our patrons. Thank you so much for listening. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to Saturday Morning Cartoons, the weekly podcast that revisits, reviews, and ridicules some of the world's weirdest animated series. Coming to you from Castle Duckula, I'll be your co-host, Dave Trumbor. <laughs> Joining me as always, someone you can definitely count on, it's Sean Paul Ellis. How's it going, sir? Ah, uh, David, 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 buddy. I'm doing well, man. How are you? My, my pun tank is dry. Oh no, not the pun tank. Man, that sounds like a medical condition, doesn't it? I got a dry pun yeah. tank. <laughs> 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 oh man. <laughs> That creep myself out. That doesn't happen too God. often. You know, you bring this up, and we had a doctor on last Just week. Last we week. could have, we could have gotten you universal health care on this episode. It would have been nice to at least get a diagnosis that doesn't cost me fifteen grand. But you know, <laughs> my dad had a dry pun tank. The grandfather before him had a dry pun tank. I think it's just Dude, it's a hereditary. Yeah, it's hereditary dryness of the pun tank. So it's unfortunate. Oof. You know, I want to be honest with mm -hmm. you, the more we say pun tank, yeah. the more I regret yeah. identifying this as a medical condition because now, pun tank. <laughs> because I'm around enough people who will make puns and wordplay comments and if they stall out, I'm going to be like, oh man, pun tank's dry. Oh no, you're, you're running <laughs> on empty. <laughs> I, I will <sighs> say we are going to talk a little bit about puns tonight, but not nearly as much as we did on the last week's episode where literally every line of dialogue was a pun. Uh, this particular cartoon, I think, is a rare kid's cartoon. You may disagree. A rare kid's cartoon that's actually more enjoyable as an adult than it may have been as a kid. Ah, I would, uh, I would venture to say that as well. Interesting. If you are wondering what we are talking about tonight, we are talking about Count Duckula. And to, to give you a little bit of history on Count Duckula, it's a British animated comedy drama television series created by British studio Cosgrove Hall Films and produced by Thames Television. It's a spinoff from Danger Mouse, a series in which the Count Duckula character was a reoccurring villain. Count Duckula aired from 1998 to 93 across four seasons in all. 65 episodes were made, each about 22 minutes in length. All have been released on DVD in the UK, while only the first series has been released in North America. Guys, Come on, guys. this show should not be confused with the short-lived 1997 Quackula, which was produced by Filmation and appeared as part of their Mighty Mouse and Heckle and Jekyll cartoon hour. So real quick, 1979, not 1997. I might throw some of our, our timekeepers off out there. 1979 yeah. Quackula, do you... 
Let me ask you this. Do you remember either Quackula or Count Duckula? Uh, I remember Count Duckula. Yes, I do not remember Quackula. I think if you look it up, I think it's another fanged duck creature, but I think he's more, I think he's a little scarier. I don't know. I didn't look this one up, but it may land on our list for a future episode. You're probably going to have to wait until Halloween cartoons next year. 2018? 2018 edition. Yeah, for Quackula, if we can find that. I'll be honest with you. He just looks like... Is it gray? Daffy Duck with fangs. No, he's kind of like a blue, but the different parts of him kind of look like a kind of like a ghostly kind of blue uh, or white. Like he really just does kind of look like. Is that like if? Are we sure that what? Are we sure that this just isn't straight up Donald Duck with just like fangs? <laughs> Maybe on? it is. Now I have to look it up too. Yeah, that's weird. Okay, so let me go back to that. So <clears> what do you remember about Count? Duckula. I remember the uh, the Thames intro music, okay. sort of the the trumpets at the beginning, and I remember uh, just the the titular character, and that's really about it. I could not pick out to save my life any of the the individual plots from the episodes, yeah. but there is one supporting character that I have a very hard time forgetting. I I wonder which one it is. It's only one of two, probably. Yeah, I'm very curious uh, to find out which one it is. You can save it for our characters if you want to wait, or I can just spoil it right now. You can and just, just spoil say it. nanny. Oh, you just nanny. Spoiled it. Nanny is, uh, I know she's just such a crazy character, and uh, the second she came on screen with sort of that very distinctive voice, and for some reason that sling, and I, I just it brought back a lot of questions in my brain that I was trying to figure out. There, from the and jump. that's that's the thing. It's like just watching this intro brought back a lot of that stuff. I I remember being kind of like impressed. And a little kind of like entranced, even from that intro, because it's such a weird thing. It's a little, we'll talk about it in a second, but it's a little spooky. It's a little cartoony. It's a little scary at times. Uh, and I remember watching that as a kid, but I don't remember anything else from the episodes at all. The characters sort of, but nothing, nothing of substance. So it was kind of nice to watch that again and have that come back in. But for people out there who are wondering what the hell we're talking about, here's kind of the synopsis of Count Duckula. Now stick with me. It's, it's a bit of a long one but it hits on some interesting points that are good to keep in mind as you watch the series, right? So it turns out that each resurrection of the character Count Duckula actually creates a new incarnation with little to no memory of its past life. Now that's right off the bat. That's a pretty interesting thing for a cartoon to do, kind of like this um, reanimation, uh, reincarnation kind of thing. It's interesting. So thus, every incarnation is free to develop its own personality and pursue its own personal interests. As we learn in the title sequence, the latest reincarnation did not run according to plan. Normally, the ritual requires blood, the source of sustenance for any vampire. But Nanny, Sean's favorite character, accidentally substitutes tomato ketchup in the place of blood during the ritual. Consequently, the newest version is not a blood-sucking vampire, but a vegetarian one. Igor, his assistant, is appalled. Even worse, his new master is obsessed with pursuing wealth and fame as an entertainer. That kind of reminded me of, like, Darkwing Duck a little bit. Right. I don't know what it is with ducks, like Scrooge McDuck's all about the money. Darkwing's all about the fame, fortune. Count Duckula's all about the fame. I don't know what the deal is with these ducks. Always preening. So the stories of Count Duckula often center around his adventures in searches of riches and fame, assisted by a castle which can teleport anywhere in the world. Very uh, clever device when you're trying to tell a story that travels all around the world. Another regularly occurring theme is the repeated attempt by Igor to turn Duckula into a proper vampire. (laughs) <laughs> Some episodes actually feature Duckula's nemesis, Dr. Von Goosewing, a vampire hunter who blindly refuses to believe the current incarnation of Duckula is harmless. So they're definitely having a lot of fun with the vampire mythology here, and they're introducing a lot of really interesting things, like the reincarnation aspect of it, the fact that he's a vegetarian, which I think came later from the writer's room. They thought that would be more fun if because he, uh, you know, was animated thanks to tomato ketchup that he turned into a vegetarian. So. Interesting. What are, what are your thoughts, kind of like high level thoughts, before we get into the theme song tonight? No, oh, I, I agree with you that you know they they create this very very unique world uh, for everything that they have, and I, just for some reason, I, I I kind of maybe it's lost on me, or maybe it's in a future episode beyond the one that we watched for tonight. Yeah. But just really, what's the what's the impulse for this fame? Like, what's the drive yeah. that Count Decula has, other than just to be famous? You know, it, it, it like as a as a vamp as a vegetarian vampire duck. Yeah. Uh, you think that would be? I enough, think that that you know, right? You know, I think that that who you know he has 
loyal he has loyal people who like Nanny and Igor who will, you know, help him and do anything that he's looking to accomplish and and go along with any harebrained scheme that he develops. He has a a magical transporting <laughs> castle that will go anywhere in the world. Just like Dracula in Castlevania. 100% <laughs> like earlier Castlevania from Netflix this right. month. So they have all of these fun things that are in there, but I guess the one thing that I I realized tonight watching the show is that it's very fun, but but what's the what's the drive? What why does he want to be famous? Is this something where he's hoping to be like a, a late night talk show host? What they never define fame for him. And that's that's the one thing that was missing that I would have liked to have understood. Like if he had this dream of being like a comedian, an entertainer, an actor. Like, what fame is just such a broad spectrum. Yeah, I guess they just had to give him something else that he was doing in order to go on these adventures, rather than, like, eating humans. But also without introducing too many other characters, I guess. I don't know. Sure. Like, if he was just, like, an adventurer, or if he was just, like, uh, wanting to... They could have played something in that, like, look, this fits perfectly with the mythology, right? So the mythology goes that his previous reincarnations are essentially, like, his ancestors. So there's this kind of hall of uh, pictures that, ha- that show off all of his previous ancestors. Rather than being obsessed with fame, it would have been interesting, and more to the, like, the drama aspects of this, if he was just interested in finding out what his ancestors were all about. Like finding his place sure. in the world and just being like, I've got this, I come from this long line of succession, but what were these people really like? Like, what did they do? Let me travel to these different places, like, I don't know, Egypt, and see what they were up to there. It's just a weird thing just to shove in this like obsession with fame and it's just right. I don't know if that ever landed with me as a kid, but definitely all the like the verbal jokes, all the wordplay definitely went over my head. There's there's a lot of stuff in here that's like meant for an older (laughs) audience for better and for worse, I think. Right. There's a lot of stuff that is very plainly dry British humor, but also some of it is a a distinct nod to older who's on first Abbott and Costello bits that they have. All very fun, but as a as a kid, when I would have been eight, nine years old watching this show, right, whoosh, right over the top of my yeah. head, I would not have gotten any of it's this. Like pop, it's like watching uh, old Looney Tunes when they were referencing like pop culture of the 40s and 50s, but you're watching it in like the <laughs> right. 80s as a kid because they were made so many years before or even earlier, you know? And you right. learn who they are over time, but as you're watching them the first time, you're just like, oh, that's just like a funny character. It's like, no, dummy, that's Humphrey Bogart, Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> that's like... You know, that's who these people are. It's all the Rat Pack. Now these people are exploding. Now you're telling me that I should not watch cartoons with things that are exploding. Mm -hmm. Now cartoons are bad for kids. Now they're good for kids again. Watch more cartoons. Watch more cartoons. (laughs) Let's do our show. Watch more. And listen to more theme songs. Let's talk about this theme song, which can you even... How much of this is a theme song? How much of this is an intro? How much of this is an exposition? What is this hybrid monstrosity? So let's frame this in a sense that this is 90 seconds. And there is so much information. There is so much information that is communicated in that 90 right. seconds that it really blew me away. You know, we, we've, we've torn apart theme songs for not really doing accurate roll calls. Uh, and, and, and for the most part, that's kind of true uh, in this Or, or in this theme we kind of give them points if they do a roll call. Because there's a lot of cartoons that don't. So we don't know who these characters are, either visually, uh, audibly for the, their voices, or by name. We don't really know who they are unless they're introduced in the theme song. Yeah. Right. And so this, this show, I think, is unique in a sense that as it's really doing the theme song, there really only is the one titular character that you need to know. And there's only really two supporting characters that are the rest of it. So, and they're going to do a name call or they're going to do a roll call in the show itself, right. which is extremely helpful. And they do that very early on. So I, I just... I want to say first and foremost for the uh, for the Thames um, sort of horn trumpet section that they have, it, it really made me laugh because in understanding the animation style, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but just understanding the animation style and that sort of like <laughs> like trumpet sound that's coming in at the very beginning, yeah. that immediately that that immediately made me think of Danger Mouse. Yeah. And then, obviously, doing research for this show, you found out that uh, ITV and C- uh, CITV or CITV also did Danger Mouse. So this was an affiliate. It's a spinoff of that. So right. uh, there's a lot of similarities. But it's that intro, like, 
Thames is coming in. It's just, it's so distinct. I love it. It sounds wonderful. And then immediately you get, cal- you get wonderful narration by Barry Clayton. By Barry Clayton, yes. You, Barry Clayton, who goes into this long 30 second sort of explanation. Very Vincent Price like. Yes. In Castle Ducula, home for many centuries to the dreadful dynasty of vicious vampire ducks. <laughs> The Count of Duckula. Legend has it that these foul beings can be destroyed by a stake through the heart or exposure to sunlight. This does not suffice. However, for they may be brought back to life by means of a secret rite that can be performed once a century when the moon is in the eighth house of blood. (laughs) The latest reincarnation did not run according to plan. And then it jumps into a late 70s kind of soulful kind of jazzy funk funky, piece spooky everything it, it was super fun it was like it was like this was after thriller right it had to be so it was it's kind of had that vibe though definitely had that kind of soul a little bit of funk to it a little funky beat but it was like a little off too so it was definitely a little kind of spooky vibe going on and and, and this is really where you get that sense of who count Ducula is they, they talk about the fact that uh, <laughs> there's not a vampire zanier than Duckula. Uh, <laughs> I love the line. My favorite line of this whole thing is, he won't bite beast or man because he's a vegetarian. I really stretched that one, but we'll give it to him. <clears throat> yeah, the wild Duckula. and wacky one they call Duckula. And it's great. It, it, it's, it, it's great. The visuals are there. It, it's showing... Count Ducula at some point, and the thing that I remembered from watching this as a kid is the moment where he turns the carrot. He pulls he pulls the vampire teeth out of his mouth, yeah. and he's like holding a carrot, and then the carrot reanimates yeah. and has vampire yeah, teeth of itself, and he freaks yeah. out and runs yeah. away. And I was like, it just went, Mwah, what a perfect Chef's kiss. what a perfect sense, to, yeah, just to understand how kind of weird. And sort of passive he is. He's not an aggressive vampire. No. He's a beta vampire. If he is. Anything. If anything. He's, a, he's no... a cuckold duckula. <laughs> cuckold duckula. Yeah. Cuckold duckula. He's a cuckold duckula. Cuckold duckula. Yep. I told you my, my he... pun tank's dry. Oh, boy. Cuckold duckula. He... <laughs> you got to put your, uh, you got to put the pun stick in the pun tank. And then you got you to gotta pull it out. And you gotta I, feel check like the, a, the pun, I feel like a doctor should level. do that. I don't think I'm allowed to I mean, do that do at it. home by myself. You can, it's, it's usually maintenance that you can do by yourself just to double check. Ooh, we're combining things that I don't like. Yep. yep. Uh, anything from the intro, because I would be remiss if I didn't also talk about the outro. But oh I my want God, you the to, outro. Um, yeah, the, I want you to give your impression about the, the intro. I mean, we're on the same page. I love the fact that this thing starts with that Thames Entertainment sort of like logo, just kind of like unfolding. There's the fanfare. You don't often see a logo for a studio at the beginning of a cartoon anymore. The ones that come to mind are like uh, Warner Brothers for Batman the Animated Series. Mostly because I've been watching a lot of it lately, but also because <laughs> it was really well done. That just kind of shows up and then it morphs into the, uh, the police blimp, the police dirigible that's like patrolling Gotham. Like, that's a cool way to do it, and I will always remember that. And then this, you, don't, you just don't see them that often anymore. Like Netflix, obviously. Netflix blasts their logo across anything and everything first on their channel, and then you get to skip it the rest of the 17 hours that you're going to binge something. Um, you just don't see that anymore. Things just jump right into it. So to see the Times logo was pretty cool. And then the rest of the ritual I had kind of forgotten, but as I'm watching it again for the first time in probably 20 years, I was like, oh yeah, probably 25 years if not more. I was like, oh yeah, I do remember this. I remember the, them, you know, the deep voice going, blood. And I remember the tomato sauce being poured in and not knowing what was going on. <laughs> and uh, we should mention that this was, uh, the theme song was sang by Doreen Edwards and Mike Harding, um, just to give mm-hmm. them their, their props, because it's a fantastic song. Let's talk about that outro, though. Because that, when I saw that again, that triggered a lot more in my mind than anything in the actual meat of the show actually did. Tell me about this outro. This outro does a great job of mixing uh, all kinds of some, like, animation some, media, yeah, all kind of visual media. Some really different types of mixed media that are in this from like still pictures 
to sort of almost like live action, uh, you know, recordings of, of things moving around yeah. to like pictures, like still pictures that they're like bouncing across the screen to show motion. Like weird little like cartoon, like animated things like little spiders or little ghosts or little hearts beating just yeah. like a weird combination of things that looked very early <laughs> it looked very early like nickelodeon style um i'm trying to think of a specific thing it reminds me of like you can't do that on television where they had that animation yeah. come together for the head and everything that kind of level of like i don't know if it's animation if it's paper that's just like stop motion together it was really visually interesting to see and, and and so to give you an idea of how the end of this show or how this show concludes, they they do a two line setup, and at the end of each line, it cuts to sort of this mixed media or sort of a reaction shot. And so it says, "If you're feeling," and then it shows like a woman, a black and white picture of a woman, kind of with her hand up in front of her face, as if she's trying to like you know, defensively yeah. shield herself, uh, and it, it screams. And so it's you. Know, if you're feeling scream, you know, scream. or uh, scream, or you're kind of, and then it has like this cutout of like a, a creeper kind of moving across the screen, and he goes, and he just kind of goes. <laughs> so again, if you're feeling scream, scream or you're kind of, <laughs> could be that you've met up with Ducula, and so that's it's it's trying to impress upon you that your interaction with a vegetarian duck vampire could be the impetus for all of these weird feelings and thoughts that you're having. And so like they, they continue on with uh, like, if your if your knees, if your knees go and it has like this, uh, is that the skeleton picture one? Of bones. The bones? Yeah. It's like skeletons. And, they go, yeah. and they're just like, click, 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 click. And so they, they just continue down this path, and there's, I feel like there's like about a dozen there's of a these lot. things, and they are, they are all wildly entertaining to watch, and so much fun, and it's so simple. It retains sort of the same hook from the theme song, yeah. so great callback same singers, I to something believe, too. that, yeah. yeah, so great callback to something that's already there that they had that they were able to just extend for this outro really fun use of mixed media which you don't really see anywhere else in the show so it really kind of feels or anywhere distinct. else anymore yeah right and intentional for that outro it just looked like they had so much fun with this and watching it i watched it at least like two or three times yeah. and every time i'm like yeah i'm really i'm really digging yeah, this. again these I were just, like the moments that like i remember like these were the, the little nostalgia triggers that like i was like oh yeah this part and it was kind of like i already knew it I already remembered it. It's like those little neurons just started firing again after being very dusty for the last 30 years. So it was, it was cool to see that and cool to like just bring them back. And it really is such an excellent use of different Foley and sound effects that just, you don't need to have words in there. You can just kind of show them through these fun pictures and mixed media that they have. And then all of this is because... And it fit with the theme of the show, which was kind of, it was fun, but within a spooky context. There's nothing scary about it. The scariest thing probably happens in the first 30 seconds of the intro where they're setting it up to be like a very spooky, scary setup. But that's it. After that, it's all just very fun. We've already mentioned, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, especially because they they demonstrate that, you know, a stake through the heart or sunlight. And so they actually show ducks like getting staked or like turning to and stone and then turning yeah. and cr- yeah and so that's kind of a really weird way to intro this vampire show and like we said it's like the voice it sounds like the voice of vincent price and they've got all the spooky music in the background like you're watching a hammer film or something so it's it was very like very spooky intro that they turned it and they flipped it about halfway through to something a lot more right. fun and enjoyable so it's a nice a nice balance of those things it's pretty fun We've already mentioned the animation style of the intro and outro a little bit, so what are we looking at for the regular show itself? How would you describe it? What would you compare it to? I mean, again, I, it, it goes hand in hand with its contemporary of Danger yep. Mouse and not the song producer. No. Nope. Uh, although he Mouth is five. fantastic as Danger well. Danger Mouse 5. So, right. They go along with uh, sort of the same Danger Mouse uh, aesthetic that they have here. The, the thing that's very interesting for this and if you're, you're trying to remember what that actual aesthetic is, it's 
it ends up being very thin lines around the character yeah. to kind of distinguish a lot of the the attributes of that person. Uh, but nothing, nothing's overwhelming, nothing's drastic or too like heavy. And then the color palette feels very unique. Like there are color, there are colors that they used in Danger Mouse that have kind of come over into Count Ducula. Mm. And obviously, because it is a spinoff, they had that opportunity. But Danger Mouse has a big villain, and a lot of that same color palette from that villain in Danger Mouse is immediately present in Count Ducula. Mm. And so. A lot of earth tones, a lot of yeah, kind of... Yeah, a lot of stone, uh, a lot of dirt, a lot of sand, right. and a lot of... Uh, well, especially in this episode, a lot of sand. We watched the first episode, which was titled... What did I have? No sacks, please. We're Egyptian. Just to throw that out there. So <laughs> pun, pun tank is dry. Pun tank. Um, but yeah, so kind of, a, <clears throat> kind of a dark look to this when they're in the castle. Everything was very dark and cobwebby. Um, very gothic setting, like low light, low candlelight, things like that. The characters were not particularly bright. I don't mean that in the intellectual sense, but that could be the same. You know, you could actually use that description as well. We even get some other characters that are introduced outside, and they all kind of had that kind of drab, kind of toned down look to them. A, a couple of them have little splashes of color here and there to kind of like set them apart. But for the most part, everything is a little, it's, it's a little diluted. It's not super bright. I would say the the one exception that I have is one of my favorite characters for Nanny because she is pink and white and just the yellow beak. Yeah, and that's but she's it's pretty much her entire but she's color still palette. even kind of like it's it's kind of like daubed down a little bit. Like it's not like a bright pink, okay. you know, it's not like a Miss Piggy's sure. dress or, a, you know, a Power Ranger. It's like it's just kind of it's almost flesh, flesh colored or flesh suit i looked up what is up with her sling her wing in a sling and i cannot i don't know what the deal is i have never been able to figure that out i don't know if it's a nod to something if it's a nod to another character or what it is but (sighs) dude gotta be something guys but yeah the other thing i could kind of compare this to i don't know it's basically just like that late 80s animation i thought smurfs for some reason but that's not even quite right it's hard to kind of describe I could it. See, I could see a little Smurfs. Little Smurfs. I could see a little Smurfs. It's just kind of like, you know, the painted backgrounds, the, the well done kind of mm-hmm. painted backgrounds. They don't really stand out, but they don't really get in the way. Um, and then the animated characters in front of it, it's pretty standard stuff. Nothing that really jumped out at me one way or the other. Nothing that I thought was particularly interesting or innovative or spoke to this is something you'll see on Count Dracula, except for that intro. I will say the one thing that I really did love is. In that intro, the level of detail for Castle Ducula yeah. is phenomenal. And they get their use out of that shot, though, because they basically shot it Ooh. once and you use it hundreds of times throughout the series. So it's a good filler. One part in the episode where they are in sort of the, the hall of Duculas yeah. with all the portraits, so much detail. But again, as you said, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of drab. It's kind of toned down a little bit. A lot of earth tones, but just... There can be so much detail in what they put in there that it is, it's, it's kind of mesmerizing to look yeah. at just a wall of just off-sized <laughs> portraits right. and frames that are just, they all kind of look like they blend together, but then all of them have like one tiny little color pop or like one tiny little interesting feature or, or like visual thing. tidbit. Yeah. Yeah, that you just, you want to look at it for a while, but they give you very little of it. And you get more detail when they stop and actually like just look at it and fixate on it. So they'll do like a still frame kind of thing where they're not actually animating anything. You're just looking at the the drawing for this particular photograph, which is smart. Uh, But they use it to tell a story, which we'll get to in a second. But yeah, anything else that jumped out of you animation wise? No, it was was pretty fluid. I mean, the motions were pretty fluid throughout. They just kind of like, the walking around there's not a lot of like action that really takes place everything's very deliberate very kind of slow paced everything is in service to the joke right so it all kind of is like a slow build up as they move from and and two of the main characters are just like these lumbering hulks so they don't move very fast to begin with and duckula kind of has to like keep pace with them so go ahead one moment of action that really caught me off guard is when they are running towards the teleportation device okay. And it's just really Count Ducula, but he's running at a, like a one fourth perspective away from the camera. Right. And he's running from like 
bottom right to top right. left. So the action, the visually, the action doesn't make a ton of sense, and it's it's very misleading because like obviously like you know our eyes are used to like reading and looking at a lot of things left to right, and so to see something move in the opposite direction, it either sometimes implies that it doesn't have a lot of weight or it's not super important or it's like a supporting motion. But this is like the only instance yeah. that you see this titular character run, like sprint across the screen into something that they haven't really talked no, about or about introduced yet. Yeah. And so there's, there's very little, uh, you know, heads up of, hey, we're about to run into this cool thing <laughs> that is very brightly colored, but it's sort of like Christmas lights. It's like a red yeah, and a like, green and like around a coffin. A, yeah, a coffin shape. It's like a, mm -hmm. a Stargate coffin mm -hmm. that he runs into. And goes to Egypt. And, Coincidentally. Yeah, and goes to Egypt. And so it's 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 a hundred and they talk about Ra. This is a guys, holy shit. We a hundred percent watched It's a Stargate. We have finally watched Stargate the cartoon. Oh. Guys, this is great. This is so I you exciting. Were tell me you hadn't watched Stargate. Kurt, Kurt Russell and James Spader were mm -hmm. there. It was phenomenal. It was great. It's a Loved real it. surprise when they get through that coffin portal to the other side <laughs> and find out that they're in a far gate. Uh <laughs> American, or American, Aqua Teen Hunger Force callback. American. <laughs> American. I don't know where that came from. Uh, Yikes. Okay, All right, so that's enough for... Pun tank is dry. Pun tank. Dripping. Um, so characters. <laughs> you've already... You've already... <laughs> we've lost it. We've lost, we're halfway through and we've lost it. Uh, you've already talked a little bit about Nanny. Do you want to talk more about Nanny and why she's your favorite and what her deal is? Let's get into some of these characters. I Sure. There's not many. I think Nanny, yeah, Nanny is is my favorite just because uh, she's so sweet. She's well intentioned. Yeah. She's well meaning. She she just wants to take care of Count Dracula. I loved how she spoke in sort of like a almost like a broken kind of Cockney yes. accent for a lot of it, and you're introduced to that immediately when she talks about the the tea and biscuits, hot cocoa and that she's bringing chalky bickies, hot cocoa and and chalky bickies. Chalky bickies. Chalky bickies. <laughs> and so she like she just she has this really fun speech pattern that is very unique and I think interesting enough to me in the the framing device of a vampire story that I don't think maybe like a young Frankenstein would have yes. had something like this. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's kind of like a fun nod to, to maybe a character that would have been there. But like chalky bickies as like a way to introduce this entire character and sort of what what they're interested in is just kind of it's unique it was unique enough for me to take notice and really enjoy and they, they had a unique way of getting her to enter and exit most scenes which go ahead what do you got and this is why i love the nanny character the most is because she is because she does not understand the concept of doors <laughs> right. now i say this i say this as somebody who's just under six foot tall. Uh, and normally when I am anywhere in a large crowd or if I'm in like a smaller confined, like a normal mm -hmm. space, I typically feel like a bull in a china mm. shop. Uh, I will run into stuff relentlessly. I have body checked walls just standing next to them. <laughs> and I'm like, what is wrong with my balance here? And I don't, I don't you get need, it. You need your, so your it, what is it called? The body awareness. <laughs> seminar or something I, I just need something I, I think a lot of it is just because i'm like don't fall into somebody else just fall into a yeah, wall that's sean the better option i guess yeah i guess, I guess. uh it shouldn't happen in the but first but if you were place. built like nanny she just trundles <laughs> through these walls into anna i love the fact that they not only use it as an introduction but it actually plays into the plot later on i thought that was really clever <laughs> and it's so fun so but to your point the trundling that she does of just barreling through these walls and breaking them down or going to a door and then bursting through the door yes. and just knocking it off of its hinges uh it's it's you see how powerful her character is early on and i feel like it's really cool to see them give that level of strength and compassion to really the only female character that you see regularly in this entire yeah, show pretty much uh, a quick note on the definition of trundling. Anyone who's out there listening and near a computer and not driving, I'd like you to look up uh, Urban Dictionary's definition of trundling. If it still says to drum rhythmically on your lover's buttocks, then that was actually put there by a friend of ours. I don't think he listens to the show, 
but uh, <laughs> roughly 15 years ago, he uploaded that definition, and I really hope that it's still there. That's my one point of trivia for the night. Um, okay, so Nanny, love her. I don't know why her wing's in a sling. I love that she gets her words confused all the time, like relic and relish, uh, things like that. <laughs> it's fun, it's frustrating, but it's also kind of fun. <laughs> I'm more partial to Igor, to be honest. Oh, get into Igor with so, me. Ooh, so Igor is essentially like the butler <laughs> assistant that's pretty standard for like a, a Dr. Frankenstein type, even though we're talking, yeah. you know, cuckold Duckula at this point. He's, he's that, uh, he's the assistant, but he's been an assistant and a caretaker for these counts for probably his entire adult life. So he's been there a while, 50 years, 60 years, or maybe he's even supernatural. Maybe he's even older. He looks kind of like an old hunched over, but kind of hulking vulture. He's a vulture. So he's got the, like the balding head. He's got the bright kind of like yellowy eyes. And he's, he's got that like demeanor that says, Yes, I'm here to serve, and I'm expected to serve, but I'm really exhausted by every decision that you make, and I just wish you were a better person. So, like, everything about him is so, like, depressing, <laughs> but he's just like, yes, sir, right away, sir. He wants to make Dracula better, but in his eyes, he wants to see him as, like, this bloodthirsty count, like every, every duck, I guess, that's come before him. So, his delivery, though, his dry humor and his delivery is fantastic throughout this entire thing. There's a sequence where there's some noises that happen off screen and it's essentially like four, <laughs> four bodies dropping off the side of their tower and hitting the ground. And Ducky even makes mention to it. He's like, that sounded exactly like four, a series of bodies hitting the ground in succession. And he's like, yes, yeah, so, but it, possibly just nanny making pastries or just like the way he delivered it. It was a weird <laughs> line, but the way he delivered it and repeatedly delivered it was fantastic. So I really, I really like Igor. How do you feel about Duckula? Like, what do you get a sense of him at all? I mean, no, not really. I, I, I love the idea of a vegetarian yes. vampire, and I love the the mix up with tomato ketchup instead of blood. It's 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 great. Uh, but as I mentioned before, this whole idea of fame and really what's the drive behind this fame? He. He is a fun character because he gets excited about right. things. And then that excitement is what carries the action of the show from beat to beat to right. beat. Because without, without him, you know, there, there really is no show. It can't, I feel like the Igor and Nanny show, for as much as we like those characters, I don't think it would be as long-lived to hit 65 episodes. No, they wouldn't do anything. And they so, just kind of hang around. They don't really even clean the place as it is. They just kind of are there to, to facilitate whatever Duckula wants oh, to do. Oh, I wish I would have brought my feather duster. <laughs> that was Nanny, by the way. Just, uh, She's yeah, seven foot they're, tall, they're by just, the way. Did you know that? I did Seven not. feet tall. Yep. That's a, a big nanny. The crazy a size big for hen, a big nanny. Big hen. We've only got uh, an, a quartet of other characters, major characters, who are in this particular show. So, do you want to just briefly talk about the Crow Brothers? Yeah. So we have the Crow Brothers. They're kind. Of, they they're thieves, yep. and they are interested in in possibly uh, procuring some art yeah. from Castle they're Ducula to, to be able to resell yeah. it. Yeah. They're they're trying to pick up some some knickknacks, some some artifacts, some relics, and be able to hawk them. And uh, it's at this point, as Dave mentioned, with their four bodies falling from the castle, that they discover that there might be a, a bigger, more significant, bountiful artifact that sort of is the the catalyst for this episode that they could steal instead, yeah. and then that will allow them bigger riches and fame and fortune. What I like with these guys is they they bring a little bit of color to the. Not, not, not only to the screen as you're looking at it, but a little bit of color as far as like the language that they speak, their sort of accent. And then it adds an extra wrinkle to the story, too. So it's essentially these like, they're like the Beagle Boys from DuckTales, right? So they're right. perennial thieves that show up and try to rob the main character. The funny thing is that they always try to scale the castle. So they're essentially like <laughs> climbing straight up into the sky, just walking, you know, like Batman and Robin did in the 60s. They're just walking straight up on the side of this castle. They always get knocked off of it in a variety of ways. Like this time it was Nanny's dusting that causes their leader to sneeze. Uh, another time they were, uh, <laughs> they were overhearing their eavesdropping on a conversation and then they actually like entered part of the, they, they joined the conversation as they're trying to sneak into the tower. 
Igor opens a window and knocks them off so they fall off again. It's funny stuff like that that happens all the time. It's the only reason we're really mentioning it here. It's a, it's a running gag throughout the entire series. So I think it happens in different ways at different times. Yeah. They really become the wily Coyote yes. of this show. They are there to sadly be abused yeah. in this oh, cartoon comic and context. We'll, we'll talk about it in the plot because they are kind of the victims of their own uh, greed, I guess, a couple different times. Yeah. So let's get into it. Any, anything else from the characters? I think we can talk about the other minor, minor characters in the plot itself. Sure, sure. So I, I had to start really by asking, okay. there's not a ton of stuff that really happened in this one episode, yeah. but I wanted to ask if you, Dave Trombor, all right, could gain some type of a magical oh, item, man. all right, that would allow you to kind of going. have people have people do your mm. bidding and, and do stuff. What would be, what? What is the quintessential Dave Trumbor item to be able to enslave the cartoon masses? Anything I want? Anything magical? Yeah, anything. Anything you want. Anything that, or it could be a normal mundane thing, and we could make it magical. Saxophone. Oh, really? Yeah, I love the fact that it was a magical saxophone. <laughs> I'm super thrilled. I was like, ooh, <laughs> magical saxophone. It makes no sense at all in the context of the show, but literally a magical saxophone is what they're looking for. <laughs> because when I, when I think ancient Egypt and curses and pharaohs and mummies and priests and, and Egyptian gods and mythology, I often think saxophone. <laughs> I don't know where this came from. What about you? What do you want, a harmonica? I, I, don't, I don't really no. know. I, I guess maybe, I mean, I would say something like maybe like a flute be, just because of... Just uh, portability. You know, in like, yeah, Greek mythology, like with Pan... Mm. And then sort of with the, the, the Pied Piper idea. See, I was thinking more practically, you know? like getting it through TSA. It's a lot easier to probably get a flute than a saxophone. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, you know, you don't want something like a, like a, like a hammer dulcimer. This is <laughs> a little like, rough. How yeah. do, you're like, how do I get? Mm. Ugh, this is, I'm just going to put it on YouTube and let that do the magic work through the, through the right. magic of the internet. Um, wasn't there, I'm trying to think of magical saxophone playing cartoon characters. And I feel like there's one in Cowboy Bebop. He's not really magical. He's just like a jazz. Isn't it the guy who's um, uh, hermaphrodite or completely asexual? There's a character who plays, um, the, plays the sax in like a jazz club, and I think he's like a hermaphrodite. Oh, okay. And then... Actually, I was, yeah. I was thinking of like in the main four for Cowboy Bebop. Oh, no, I don't think there's any sax playing hermaphrodites in the main four. Um, and then in uh, Trigun, I think Trigun, I think there's a sax player who actually has like, I think, or maybe that was like the horn freak. Do you remember that? The yeah, horn freak? of course. I don't remember if it was a trumpet or a sax or something like that, where he had like abilities that were tied into the instrument. What, these are the weird threads that like get connected in my brain. Like, oh, what other characters played a magical saxophone in the cartoon world? No, it was a, it was a Mid-Valley, the Mid -Valley horn, horn Freak was yeah. the, was the character in Trigun that had that. Was it a yeah. sax or was it a, a horn? No, it, it was, was a sax. sax. Okay, cool, it was cool, a sax. Cool. A sax is technically a horn. Uh, people say horn like, like a trumpet or a trombone, though. Which, for another time. All right, so magical... I mean, yeah. do, we, do we dial it back and just say like a reed or like a reed-based instrument? But that's the thing. Like, you wouldn't call... I don't know. Do you call a clarinet a horn? Yeah. Do you call a clarinet a horn? Yeah, I think it's in the horn family. That's weird to me. Is it? I, I think of the telephone. Get on the horn. <laughs> I, but I, that's just, that's colloquial slang. That but that's we the thing. It's all kind of been mushed up. I don't know. <laughs> Listeners out there, let us know what you think a saxophone is. Moving on. So magical saxophone in ancient Egypt for some reason. As, as Sean was mentioning earlier, like nothing happens in these cartoons without Ducula getting excited and, and interested in something. And this point, when Igor walks him through like the history of his family, he stops and tells him about this, uh, uh what? Uh, what was his name? Count Archduck, the Archduck, who was an Egyptologist. And he explored uh, the tombs and the pyramids. And then one day he knew, you know, Igor knew just enough of this story to where he met a priest and his assistant. And that was it. That was all they'd ever heard of him. And nothing had been heard since then. But he was in search of a magical saxophone. So what's Duckula interested in finding out in this episode? Magic then, saxophone. Magic sax. Let's take that castle to Egypt. How are we going to do it? 
get a jump through Stargate Coffin Apparently. and show up uh, in a music video of George Michael from Kalos. Yeah, it's Whisper. weird how it all worked out. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's right? Really strange. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like in my brain, you have to realize. I, I don't know what it was in terms of the time, but let's be honest. There was a lot of saxophone in popular yeah. music in the eighties, and so I mean, like you had even like Hall and Oates. You know, with like Maneater that had sax, like you had yeah. Chicago, you had Foreigner yeah. that had sax at some point, Dire Straits, Rick James. And so you just, you know, Billy Ocean. I mean, you like, you just had all these different, I mean, Kenny yeah. G, it's like his bread then, and butter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you just had all of this music that had saxophone. I feel like for me personally, you know, you, you even had it in The Simpsons, like with yeah, Lisa yeah, playing yeah. the and saxophone. every episode. So like, I mean, technically that was in the 90s, but like, yeah, it was around that time that you would see that in like every episode. Yeah. Uh, we, you even had uh, culturally relevant at that point, you had the California yep. Raisins uh, and they had Bill saxophones. Clinton, again, not till the 90s, yeah. but, you know, playing the saxophone. And so, you know, you, you had all this stuff. I feel like all of that music and pop culture about saxophones um, like when I was growing up and you, I don't know if they did this like when you were in elementary or like early middle school, but they brought us into a band yep. room and they showed us all these instruments and they're just like, if you're interested in playing anything, Pick like it up we play can, it. Yeah. you can, yeah, you can sign up for band and these are some of the instruments and this is sort of the, the sound and what these instruments make. And so you'd have somebody who would get up and play the saxophone or play the trumpet or the trombone and, you know, guitar. And so you get all that exposure and like i swear to god because of all of the music and the Cal- probably the california raisins that was the main one Simpson, yeah. i i had a thing for california raisins when i was yeah. a kid no, they were cool and i had a ton i had a ton of just their yep. little like action figures the little like plastic non-moving action <laughs> yeah, figures just like the, they were like displayed on a on a shelf for no reason yeah they, no were, they were my my kid tchotchkes Filling oh that no reason Oh, filling, filling it up, it. buddy. So we had, uh, I had all these child tchotchkes of just non-moving California raisins that I would arrange like it was a yeah. band, and then I would just do through the grapevine, yeah. uh, like with no instrument yeah. whatsoever, just my, just my voice. So I, I, when I was given that opportunity, right. I remember saying, like, I want to play the saxophone. And I remember telling my mom, I was like, I want to play the saxophone. And she's just like, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. And I was like, really? And she's like, Nah. I don't know. What does she I, want I don't you to play, if, something... if anything? I, I, don't, I never ended up... I cannot play any instrument. What the fuck? I can play a little bit. I can play a little bit of piano and a little bit of guitar. Oh, that's so sad. And some ukulele. But, uh, our my stories mom were kibosh. similar right up until the mom part. Yeah. Because then my mom was just like, all right, I guess I'll listen to a terrible <laughs> saxophone player for the next 10 years. I think my mom was a realist for a lot of stuff. Like, when I... When I decided to go to college and, and when I was fortunate enough that I had the opportunity to go and everything and my mom was just like, what do you want to major in? And right out of the gate, without any hesitation, saxophone. I am imme- <laughs> saxophone. And she's just like, no, <laughs> no. no, I, but I really, I did say acting. Oh, yeah. I was like, I want to go for theater. I want to go and I want to be an actor. And she kind of was like, and I, I, I this wasn't relevant until maybe like six years later when the television show Southland mm. got bought by USA and I met Michael Cutlass uh, in DC and he had this whole talk where he was just like, you know, when I was getting ready to go to college and I wanted to do this and I, I had this in, intent, like intense passion to be able to pursue this line of work and I told my parents and they were just like, yes, that's what you have to do. I was just like, oh, that's funny, because I had that exact same talk, and my mom was like, let's be realistic, yeah. dentistry. Mm, yikes. <sighs> it is really funny, though, to see what level of, like, parental involvement can do. Because mine, like, honestly, I didn't know what engineers were or what engineers did until I was already, like, halfway through college. When I started talking to people in engineering programs, I'm like, wait, you get to do what? Like, that's, I've been doing that, like, my entire life just without any, like, tra- any training or know-how. Yeah. Just, like, tinkering and exploring and tearing stuff down and building it up. But I didn't have any mentors or anybody who even, like, lived in that world to know that that was a possibility. So it's funny the things that, like, basically what I'm saying is everybody's got to find their own path. And you may have potholes along the way. It may be paved in gold. It may be whatever. It may be full of veget- vegetarian vampire ducks. Who knows? And, and... 
and you're right, like everybody needs to find that path. But a 10 year old yeah. me was just like, you know what? Saxophones do rule you the world. You should come over to my place and just play like rogue saxophone without your mom knowing. <laughs> That'd have taught you. <laughs> Secret, Secret sax. Secret saxophone. Secret sax oh, Sean that would have been fun, man. Damn. That's our new cartoon coming out 2018. Secret <laughs> sax. Secret sax. Just two, just two uh, kids playing the sax together. Uh, we are just filling up that pun tank and the wordplay mm, tank nonstop. nonstop. Secret no, sax. No, I, I literally miss playing saxophone almost every day of my life. Because I played, really? yeah, I played since I was like eight years old up through, uh, I didn't play in college. It was like a great regret that I did not continue in college. But I've played alto tenor, Barry. And I'd really like to play soprano and bass at some point if I could. Man. But it's been so long that it's like, I don't even know. So when things like this come up, like Magic Sax comes up in an episode of Count Duckula, like I'm all in. It's the it's best. It's the best. Uh, you the know what best. else is the best? The, ha- the other thing that I forgot was in the show at the halfway point. <laughs> okay. Do you remember these guys? Oh, the, uh, yeah, the clock. <clears throat> the cuckoo um, clock, but with they the have, bats. They have... Right, they have these bat cuckoo clock brothers that come out and they they're little Russian. They bats. kind of face, yeah, and they and they they face sort of the the audience, and it's kind of breaking the fourth wall a little wall, bit. A little it's bit. it's like watching it's a, a variety show. What was the one where they used to come out of the either the cornfield or the like hee haw like or what's the one with the the doors in the wall? There were a bunch of like just different Oof. doors. They would pop out and just tell a joke. Same thing as hee haw. Same yeah. idea. Oh, are you talking about the the lockers and you can't do that uh, same same anymore? kind of thing same kind of thing <laughs> i can't remember that variety show but yeah same same idea but this okay. is yeah dimitri so the, and sviatoslav yeah this these yeah. were great and it, it just it was such a weird non sequitur yeah. just transition into something that was super super silly again it was it was a good amount of like little silly wordplay and speaking of wordplay you know? this is where we get to hear nanny they start to get into like the Egyptian mythology a little bit as they're, they are now in Egypt. Camels have run into the castle thinking it was a mirage. That's funny. Uh, but they are now inside the pyramid looking for uh, the saxophone and they're going through this whole thing. And Igor is filling him in on like the historical everything. He says, Oh, in front of you is a statue of Anubis. And Nanny's like, Oh, and she covers up Duckula's eyes and she's like, I can't have you looking at such a thing. He's like, no, he said Anubis, not a nudist. And she's like, oh, well, I guess that's fine. But they, they just have a, a ton of little jokes like that that, again, probably as a kid, wouldn't have made any sense to me. But as you go on, as you get older, like, you appreciate their, their wordplay. The biggest wordplay is probably coming up in a little bit, but I did not really oh, laugh but... at the short circuit joke. I thought that was a little stretched. Yeah, it was, it really was. And I think they even had, like, a rim shot They may have, it. because they knew like, it was that bad. Quick. Yeah. Because it, it was, it was something where they're talking about circuit. Who is? Is that an actual like goddess or something of mythology? Is that an actual name? I think it is. I, I believe I've never so. heard it, but that doesn't I'm, mean... I'm taking. This is how crazy yeah. this is. Is that I'm taking the word of a British cartoon <laughs> yeah, show about a vegetarian Dracula duck, where I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, circuit, probably a thing there from. There actually is S E R Q E T circuit. Oh. Uh, goddess of fertility, okay. nature, animals, medicine, magic, and healing, venomous stings, and bites in Egyptian mythology. Okay. But it's spelled S E R either K or Q E T. So this is where they get Did the you, joke. But the setup for the joke is that there are several of these dolls that are like on top of a tomb. Yeah, idols. Yeah. And, and, and Count Ducula grabs one of them and he, he looks at it and they're just like, oh, these are, uh, you know, these are kind of, uh, you know, oh, it's a uh, it's it's circuit. circuit. Yeah. And, and Nanny goes, oh, they're, they're rather, rather small. they're rather small. And, and just, you just immediately are just like, please don't do this joke. Please don't do this joke. And then he just goes, oh, it's a short circuit. Uh, and then, boom. and then they move on. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm at least glad that if they were going to make that simple of mm-hmm. a joke, that unlike other shows that we've talked about, it didn't linger right. in that beat for right. too long. They were like, you know what? It's a bad joke. Moving we on. recognize it's a bad joke. We're on that to the next thing. It might even have been like, like right we... before the cut to the, uh, the bats and the cuckoo clock, actually. It might have been like right there because <laughs> they needed to move on very quickly. Um, speaking of moving Oof. on, so we talked briefly about Nanny kind of like trundling her way through walls and doors. This is where that actually comes into play because 
while our heroes or whatever you want to call them are are uh, grave robbing and treasure stealing everything from the pyramid <laughs> The crows are trying to do the same to them. So the crows are like, now they're setting traps. Like they've gone from just being thieves to being like straight up just like murderous crows. Aha. Um, I didn't mean to do it, but there it is. Pun tank. There it is. Pun tank. So they're, Fill it they're up. setting up like these ridiculous traps. Essentially, they have like a giant block of like granite above the doorway with a rope strung across the door. So that when the guys walk through the doorway, they'll just be smushed into duck paste by this giant granite block. However, Remembering that Nanny does not use doors, she just completely just bypasses everything and just walks through the walls of uh, everything on either side of the doorway. However, this does turn. Why does why does Duckula come back in and try to steal that rope for any reason? And 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 again, it was like one of those like shh, they needed a reason yeah. to smush them to to just flatten this murder yeah. of crows, and so. Count Decula is heard running and kind of turning the corner. Now, at this point, like, these crows were in clear view yes. of him, and he really didn't seem <laughs> no. to react or do anything. He was like, oh, hey, there's some rope. That w- there's some loose rope that it we can have. And he loose. It snaps was like the rope. taut, strung through yeah, pulleys. It was, rope. It was, yeah. Exactly. Like, this, this was a whole setup yeah. that they had. And he just breaks this rope, and then, you know, the, the device that they had, this giant brick, just comes down and smashes them and so they are they are flat but they're not point. done because they essentially try to set up like a like an indiana jones rolling boulder of death later on but using like a giant slingshot as well and through some miscommunication they end up getting launched out of the side of the pyramid on the ed on the edge of this giant sort of slingshot ball so they're pretty much done <laughs> at this point they're out of the picture and now is when we get to probably the biggest setup for wordplay in this entire episode so where do you want to start with this? With the, the priest and his assistant? Or do you want to start All with right, the name so of the goddess? Or what, what are we doing here? We, so you're introduced to the to sort of the, the priest and his assistant earlier yeah. on. In, yeah, in the flashback. And so remind me of these okay. names, Dave, because they are So when, when Archduck originally meets the assistant, the first, the priest's name, and he's a priest of the goddess Upshees. Upshees. Remember right. that. Upshees. Upshees. Uh, the priest's name is Humite, and his assistant is Yubi. Right. Humite, Yubi. I just got the I, joke. I watched it a couple times just it. to make sure oh, that it was geez. all sinking in. I was like, ah. Ah, uh, this is embarrassing. Well, honestly, the first time I watched it, like, Yubi made more sense. But then I, I got the Humite the next time around i was like okay oh, now we're here boy. so this whole thing is set up so that duckula ends up in the same throne room he is interacting he's like tied down to this slab now he's interacting with the priest who might and the assistant yubi and they have this who's on first thing that goes on for for me a little too long but it was it was fine this whole thing was but yeah. what it but it ended in a slight dance it number, ended Dave. in a slight dance number because it essentially ends up <laughs> it essentially ends up with with one of them asking who the the god who like the main god of egyptian mythology is and one of them says who and the other one says ra and then they all start dancing and they say and up she rises and they just start doing mm-hmm. hoorah and up she rises over and over and over again to the point that uh uh yubi gets sick he says he gets seasick because this is like an old sea shanty so right yeah, this entire episode was essentially being built up just to get to that joke. That's the main joke that they've been building to this entire time. Nothing else makes and any guys, sense or means anything in this episode. And guys, if you're writing a cartoon and it's, it's the pilot episode that is going to launch into 64 more episodes, please, please always go back and think what would Abbott and Costello Definitely. do and then and, and then just try to recycle a joke that they had from their vaudeville days and apply it into something in 1988 guess what still you applicable. know what's funny about that and I know you're joking sort of but what's funny about that is if you go and look up this episode on YouTube one of the top YouTube comments is a timestamp and says hey it's that song from SpongeBob SquarePants I'm not even kidding and if you click on, I don't know, what they didn't have a link to Spongebob, but I'm assuming it's this exact same song that's used in Spongebob. Oh so yeah, it literally is, they took a page from Count Duckula <laughs> and Abbott and Costello and used it again in here. Or at least this, this oh song, God. you know, they use the kind of like colloquial song that everybody kind of knows 
from God, how many, 200 years ago? Who knows, yeah. 400 years? I have no uh, idea. But, I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's that kind of humor where I, I appreciate the craft that went into it more than I laugh at the joke, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I did too. It's kind of like, got it. Speaking of got I, it, how, I, do we, I, how do we get to the saxophone? Because it's got to show up at some point. Uh, so there is a, so at, at some point, Count Ducula, uh, after Yubi gets sick, they move into sort of a, a, a crypt or a, a tomb that's in there. Nanny makes mention that there is a, a, a vase. A well, vase. Nanny also busts through this door and is now assumed to be who? Uh, Upshi. Upshi rises. Right. So, uh, who might and you be are totally cool now pretty much with whatever they want to do because they feel that the reincarnation of their of their yep. priestess is there and it's it's also really cool too because then they they cut to a hieroglyph <laughs> yeah uh and it's a picture of Basically, nanny's yeah. like head it's like her yeah. torso and it looks identical to this goddess that they're praising so it's a uh, it's very cool they move into this further crypt they see this base pick it up drop it and there's more wordplay that goes on with that too which is just like it's just very silly yeah there's the whole higher uh hieroglyphs and like lower that glyphs that was earlier that it's like earlier it was yeah, on bleh. it's an, uh, it's again it's another rim <laughs> shot so <laughs> but it, but again like i appreciate what yes. went in there i didn't always laugh at it but it was still entertaining to me to just sort of be like ah, i see what you did there and i'm smart enough to get now, this stuff yeah, right now so 20 years later yeah yeah so they uh they Drop this bass, saxophones inside. Sure, that's where I got mine. Most instruments they, are like hatched then, out of vases or eggs. That's how you get your first instrument. And then you oh. use it to stun other instruments into unconsciousness, and you just collect them up and make them your musical slaves. Oh, so it's like instrument so Pokemon. It's exact, Pokemon actually stole it from like how normal kids get instruments. What? I mean, that's how we did it at my school. You know, Ugh. assuming it's the same everywhere. I feel like... I feel like our intro to band was very different from these. <laughs> My intro to band was wandering in a field, <laughs> cracking open an egg, and throwing vases and being like, I choose and you. And just like, dun, 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 trumpet. Dun, dun. Playing in the background the whole time it was weird. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they play it's this super saxophone. Effective. Go ahead. <laughs> the saxophone actually it is, is super, super effective. Not, it doesn't sound great to begin with. Uh, it sounds terrible. <laughs> they, they eventually <laughs> get like an actual person playing a saxophone. 30 seconds later. Yeah, and thankfully, because then we kind of have this, we end sort of with this yeah, musical number. Mash. We do a little monster mash. Uh, now, we have, we have like a final kind of outro joke that yes. they have, but a- anything notable from you for this whole, we, we talked all about saxophones enough tonight. Anything noticeable or, or memorable about this sax moment that they have at you the know, end? You know, it was weird. The whole thing was Duckula wanted to get his hands on the saxophone because he wanted to have, like, fame and fortune. But at the end, you know, Nanny says something to the fact, like, oh, that's a song that could only, that could wake the dead. And it does, because it's just a bunch of mummies and stuff that are <laughs> dancing. So there's no real payoff there. It essentially just, like, literally wakes the dead and everybody has a dance party and that's about it. So they're like, well, time to go. And with the, the exception of this final joke and a little bit more of the mythology of the castle and how it kind of works, yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing else. That's why I said the whole premise of the episode was to get to that hoorah and up she rises joke. That was it. Because the saxophone's basically yeah. a MacGuffin at this point. Because it, it peaks at yeah. that point. And now you get this slight offhanded comment where, again, we don't really understand right. how Castle Ducula transports. I don't know how castles work. Yeah, I don't understand no. how castles work. I also don't understand how uh, Stargate coffins no. work either. So for for a later episode, so because I want to explore the science behind this, not no. at all. So we we get to this point where Igor then makes this offhanded comment. He's like, "So we really have to get back to the castle," and then they don't. <laughs> And then the castle disappears <laughs> and goes back to Transylvania. He, he either says it's not time yet or it's it's time soon. I don't remember which one he said, but I, I, you get the idea that there's like this time aspect of the traveling with the castle. So like maybe like a Cinderella midnight yeah, slipper pumpkin or a thing that you're like that closes what? after a certain amount of time. So oh. it's like I guess this thing or sliders, you know, <laughs> some oh, yeah, yeah, sliders. Like Jerry O'Connell's dysfunctioning watch. Or malfunctioning. Oh, I was talking about the little like burgers. Yeah, from White Castle. Same. 
Yeah, wank out. Like, you can only eat so many sliders before something terrible is going to happen to you. It's, it's all the same. It's all tied yeah, together. Yeah, and usually Jerry O'Connell is yeah, my he waiter. he just shows up and just keeps giving you more sliders. He just shows up. Um, yeah. Man. <laughs> uh, so, we, we get the idea that, like, there's a time, there's a clock, there's a countdown tied to this Stargate coffin. And if you miss it, you're screwed. You are wandering in the desert, and hopefully that a bunch of crows on some camels will come pick you up and take you home. <laughs> That's pretty much where we're left. Right? Like, that yeah. was it. There's a mummy and some crows on some camels, and the camels guys, call back to earlier where they thought that the castle was a mirage, and they're like, see, I told you it was a mirage, and these three have to be a mirage, and they just, like, walk right by them. Yeah. Because at this point, we cut to the That's outro. It. And outro this like time. this fun sounding sound effects. And that's it's it. It's outro time, boys that's and girls. Whole show. <laughs> that's the whole show. Uh, anything else from the overall episode before we turn it over to our our good buddy for uh, love it and hate it? No. <laughs> anything no. from you? It was fun. Uh, we'll talk about it in recommendations, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So, guys and gals and everybody listening, we have opinions. We have very strong mm. opinions about the cartoons that we watch. Uh, guess what? All of you on the internet that contribute and post and write lovely comments, uh, you guys also have very strong opinions too, which we love. So we are going to turn this now over to longtime listener and friend of the show, Bobby Anthem, for this week's Love It or Hate It. Bobby, take it away. This week's Love It was submitted on December 23rd, 2007 by Dragstrip from the United Kingdom. He titled it An Animated Television Masterpiece with a rating of 10 out of 10. Count Ducula is my all-time favorite cartoon, and I believe it to be one of the very best, too. I loved it as a very young kid, but I doubt I could have appreciated just how special it actually is. The weakest episode of Ducula would be the highlight of many another TV series. What makes this show truly special is the comedy. The show is frequently hysterically funny, even after multiple viewings. Not only that, but the humor goes into territories often overlooked in cartoons. It is primarily verbal humor, with frequent diversions into black and surreal comedy. If I have not described the show well enough, it is mostly because I could never do it justice. Even if you think you're too old for cartoons, you are not too old for Count Ducula. Believe me. As for your hate it, there doesn't appear to be a real hate it. Nobody hates this cartoon. The closest we could find was a 3 out of 5 star rating on Amazon by Samuel H., on January 24th, 2015, Samuel said, okay. The, the absolute, absolute best. best. My, favorite, my favorite was this week's Hate It, which we struggled to find because <laughs> honestly, a lot of people love this show. Um, yeah. It was really tough to find. To be honest, we did not find a Hate It <laughs> for this show, as you can tell by Bobby's reading of this week's Hate It. <laughs> um, a lot of people just love this one. So, all right, buddy, what do you think? So we're, we're talking recommendations now. Do you recommend Count Ducula? And if not, does it get the dip, meaning it's erased from all existence, all time? You can't even bring it back with a Stargate. I am going to recommend cool. this show. I really, really enjoyed it. I thought that I'm now mature enough to understand a lot of the wordplay and the jokes. While... I don't always love the execution of some of the things that are on there. It was still really enjoyable to watch the, the Thames intro, the, the music for the intro and the outro were phenomenal. And I just love seeing the nanny character. She is so crazy and, and such an oddball. I, I, I almost want to continue watching episodes because I want to see more of the things that she's going to trundle right through. And just as an FYI, if anybody's wondering, 100% our friend's definition for trundling is nice. still the top choice on That's Urban Dictionary. That's amazing. So vote it up. Or down. I don't know. Definitely it's vote it you. up. It's amazing. What are, how, what are your feelings? Uh, I feel the same way. I'd recommend it. And it's weird that I would recommend this more to people our age who may have remembered it as a kid, but never really watched it a lot. I'd say go back and revisit it because it's actually really well done. And like Sean said, like a lot of the jokes, they land but they're not super funny. It's more like you appreciate the craft that a, that a, 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 a British person of dry British wit 
took the time to put this together. And it's just kind of like, good show. You just want to give them a, you know, a harumph, a hearty harumph, and just let them know they did a good job and to not be so depressed and weary all the time. It's going to be fine. Give them give a hoorah upshe. Yeah. What? Hoorah upshe. That's how you activate a cough and stargate oh, is you give it well, a hoorah upshe. Kicks it off. Mysteries unlocked. Aliens. 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 You know, we have to come up with a cartoon gimmick because we talked with this idea before that every year, maybe around Christmas time, this will be our Christmas holiday gift to our listeners out there. We toyed with the idea of someone being able to pull a cartoon back from the dip. Ooh. But I think we need to tie it into a cartoon somewhere. But it might be the end of the year. We'll look back on like the, the story so far, what cartoons have been dipped, and maybe put it to a Pretty vote. Pretty much all of September. <laughs> the entirety of September has been dipped. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be rough. <laughs> maybe we'll do that, though. We'll give you guys a, like a Christmas reprieve. Or like a New Year's save or something. You can pull one back a year. That's it. Yeah. Ugh. We're still working on it. That was... <laughs> I was thinking Stargate We're going to pull one cartoon no through, through the Stargate coffin. Sense. No. The, car- the cartoon coffin will bring something Ooh, out of the cartoon now coffin. now you're talking. Okay, I do like that. I only work in alliteration when it comes to filling up my That's pun really tank. That's really good, though. It's a smart way to keep your pun tank full. It's not really a pun tank then at that point. It's just more a wordplay tank. I mean, that's fine. It's getting a little. I think you just notched down a couple. I'm re- I'm re- I'm, re- I'm reaching. Yeah, you're reaching. All right. So, cartoon coffin. Look for cartoon coffin at the end of the year. Everyone loves to celebrate the holidays with talk of a cartoon coffin. So, <laughs> stick around for that. Uh, we do have some more spooky tunes. Well, we got one more week of spooky tunes. We have one more and week of spooky tunes. It's gonna come out right before the Halloween for screams. Ooh. So stay tuned. Hopefully, you guys have been liking it so far. Uh, if not, hang in there because we're getting back to regular programming <laughs> in November, which will be fun too. Sean, buddy, what do you have coming up in the next couple of weeks for the folks out there? Guys, as always, I do live improv comedy in Washington, D.C. with a group that's called Knox. That's N-O-X exclamation point. We perform with Washington Improv Theater. You can find showtimes and dates and tickets and everything with dc.org. And I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Paul Ellis. And you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Claw MD. You can also find me on Collider.com, Nerdist.com, and DaveTrumbor.com. If you want to find out more about this show right here, we would love it if you'd head on over to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Saturday Morning Cartoons. Remember, that's morning with a U. You can also head on over to our website, SaturdayMorningCartoons.com. Follow us on Twitter at Morning Tunes. Take a look at Sean's handiwork on our Instagram page. Keep the lovely conversations going on Facebook. And listen to our free audio podcast each and every week through YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. As always, if you just want to drop us a line, feel free to do so through uh, email, SaturdayMorningCartoons at gmail.com. Like I said, it's got one more week of spookiness. I think it's going to be a fun one. This one I remember being fun as a kid. It could blow up in my face. Uh, We're going to find out. We're going to find out next week. And you're gonna join us, and we hope that you do. These are starting to sound. These are starting to sound like threats. We hope that we hope that you better do it, or else. Duckula. Duckula. Go check it out, and thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Hey everybody! Thanks a lot for listening to Saturday Morning Cartoons. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to transform and roll out. <laughs>